Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode five of Film Club. What's up, John Eric? Woop, woop. How much? Been in excited the house. for this one. Yep. Been excited for this one. Brad here again, doing some uh, some horror. We're continuing on on the Nightmare on Elm Street series, part three, the Dream Warriors, or Dream Warriors. Um. Yeah. What do you think of this movie, man? I fucking love it. Uh, yeah, I think it is such. Uh, it's it's in my mind like the first one. Obviously, I the OG nightmare. I have a special place in my heart for, but like this to me is just the nightmare movie. This is so builds on like it's a proper sequel. It builds on the uh, the the original, and yeah, I love this movie. I love everything about this movie. Characters. The soundtrack. The soundtrack. The oh my god. Soundtrack's so good. And they brought Everything. they brought the OG back, eh? It's not the same Charles Bernstein, but they have the piano piece in here with a new soundtrack by Angelo yeah. Badalamenti of uh, Twin Peaks, David Lynch. Everybody knows oh. that music, right? So I think it was a good sound amazing soundtrack. Uh and of course yeah bringing back that OG theme, it just feels, I don't know, for me, like what you said, it feels like Nightmare. It it feels like nightmare. Yeah, we talked about last, we've, we talked about, about part two, and part two, it is what it is. It If you look at it for what it is, a, like you said, a possession movie, it's it's okay. It's not bad. But I mean, I'm not big on part two. I, I had to watch two in, in literally two parts because yeah. I was falling asleep and like it was, it's only 80 minutes long. That's not a lot. It's not a long movie. Part, yeah. Yeah. 80 or 90. But like part three, like I'm, I was watching it uh, last week and I'm just thinking, God damn, this movie is so good. Like it's just so, it's, it's got the 80s or like just the cheesing. It like it gets into a little bit of cheesiness towards the end, but it's got yeah. some really, like scary shit that would have if I'd seen it as a kid would have that like just yeah like the, the opening scene the opening scene with her like with him slitting her wrists oh it's just like Jesus Christ yeah it's brutal and the way they frame it too right like um the opening mm-hmm. of this movie even if you weren't to see the other films uh, getting into yeah, this movie right? you could just walk into this movie and watch it and I think you'd I mean, I mean, certainly someone who's yep. seen the first one would get a kick out of Heather Langenkamp coming back and returning, and uh, John okay. Saxon, of course. But you know, um, if you were to walk into this movie blind, I feel like you could still have a good experience because the characters are all well introduced, and you know, obviously Patricia Arquette, yeah, as uh, Kristen, is uh, a really good performance. I think everybody does a good job in this movie, acting wise. Um, this one, Absolutely. that's the thing too, is that it actually has like. <laughs> like really like good actor like Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, you're still Larry character. in this one, eh? Larry Fishburne. Max. Larry Fishburne, that's right. That's when he's still Larry. Oh my god. He and his part is so it's tiny, but it's uh it's good, mm-hmm. you know? Like he is like a likable mm-hmm. character and yeah. uh like we talked about before and it's been said a hundred times, it sounds like I'm just bragging on other you know, maybe like a Friday the thirteenth character or something to that effect, but yet you care about these characters. Like when the girl is in the, you know, the move, wannabe movie star is having her cigarette and burning herself and Larry Fishburne walks in and, you know, he's kind of given her, you know, he's the authority figure, but he's not the parents, right? He's on the outs. He's operating on the mm-hmm. outsides and he kind of like, yeah, just, I never saw you. Right. And like his, he's a really nice Ooh, middle of the ground okay. character. Yeah, like that. That's what I, I like. I, one of my big things with uh, slashers or horror movies is that if you don't care about the characters, then there's no stakes. So there's some movies where I've like 80s slashers or 80s movies where I've been watching it and I'm watching the characters and they're dumb as fuck. And like they're just you're, you're <laughs> yeah. literally just yeah. like, all right, kill them. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. You're just Go waiting. Ahead. You're waiting for it. Or you're rooting, right? Yeah. I mean, you still kind of root yeah. in this. You root kind of for... This is where it starts to get fun. This movie, it's just like, yeah, with like the Jennifer, like the TV, she wants to be the wannabe. And like that scene, it's just like, oh my God, you like really feel bad for them when they get killed. 
Yeah, <laughs> like and, like the one the Terran, the Terran character. Like, there's so many like Joey, like all the like all the characters in this movie that you just really feel bad for because these are kids in in like a in a hospital, right? And they're yeah, that's I think yeah. that's a, one of the. So, it's interesting. Like, it's it's a very different film than the other ones in that sense that there's another, you know, where one it's like the burden of the parents being passed down to the kids. That still is is right. in effect, but this time we have troubled kids, right? Which is such a unique aspect exactly. because I know that, um, well, basic housekeeping stuff, you know, this movie had a little longer time to percolate and came out in 87, release date February 27th, 1987, and made $44 million. So it did good numbers. Oof. Huge, yeah. Yeah, I think the budget was only about four and a half million so it made wow. made them a lot and of course you know not jumping the shark here but 88 was when the next one came out so they were pumping these things out once once they realized that you know this movie made a lot of money and a lot of impressions like I, this was going back to that um the f one of the, f the first time i think i ever saw this was another bootleg <laughs> vhs back in the back in the 90s it must have been recorded off one of the channels and all i remember vividly the first time I watched the movie I was watching it with uh, maybe I already seen it or just, I just remember the anecdote that I was at my cousin's house and he was he's a few years younger than me and um, I felt like the biggest baby because we watched Dream Warriors and it's on an old rickety VHS and, you know you can't really spot all the practical effects in this movie they just look they just they still look good even on like the blu-ray I watched like most of the stuff still holds up practically, <clears throat> but obviously with like a I little bit of analog, yeah. Yeah. Like with analog, you know, on cassettes and stuff, they would, and it was like just stolen off a channel or on a bootleg cassette. Right. So it, the quality was pretty bad. So, you know, the scene that stuck out when we watch it anyway, we were sitting there watching it and uh, it's the scene where Kristen is talking to her mother and then Freddie pulls her out of the room and gives her the, you know, blades and cuts her head off and then the decapitated head is talking the mother's talking to Kristen to her daughter that scene yeah. haunted me like I had a tough time sleeping that night my cousin was younger than me and he's just like sound asleep he's snoring and I'm like thinking of how Freddy's going to come in you know I had a wild imagination and I was like I must have been like you know probably like 12 <laughs> And I was still, oh. I was, I was still scared as shit, dude. I was certain Freddie was gonna get me. I was like a scared. Like it, this was one of the times where I was like, I could literally say, Freddie is really scary in this movie, but he still. This is where he starts to, you know, have his one liners. Well, <laughs> he does like the welcome to primetime bitch, obviously, and like uh, what's the uh, drug overdose uh, line? What a rush! Yeah. <laughs> what a what rush! Shit. Yeah. Like that, those are later in the film. Yeah. And for me, rewatching it, the, I think uh, he obviously doesn't cr kill Kristen in the first scene. Uh, I just like this throat or the uh, wrist slitting. Yeah. And the and, chase in the house. And, that part's I, really cool. I like that part right, too. Right. But I think, I think rewatching it, I think the first kill, which oh, I can't remember the character's name. But it's where he literally pulls out his veins and uses them as a, a, marion, a marionette, yeah, a pu like a puppet. Yeah, that's the guy who does the puppets. Yeah, watch. I'm rewatching re that and I'm thinking, holy shit, this is fucked up. It's dark because yeah. I feel like he's not. He's not. He's not laughing. Or he's, sorry, he's not making jokes. He is laughing. He's laughing maniacally, and it's, it's creepy as shit. Yeah, and the way that it, it cuts between like the kid walking. And like, just it looks like he's sleepwalking. To the, I think there's like a, a pumping, like a pulse, uh, pulse on the score. Yeah, yeah. And oh, it's... just seeing Freddy, and then, then I, I forgot about the shot when he's up, and they're all screaming at him. And it's like terrifying when they're screaming at him when he's up on the, uh, basically in the in the high window when he's about yeah. to jump. Yeah, you see Freddy, you see Freddy in the in the clouds. I was like, this this is sh terrifying shit. If I said yeah. this as a kid, this would have warped me. This would have warped me. If I was a kid, like I didn't see it until I, I was in my twenties, right? So, yeah. like I came for a lot of horror movies. I came uh, late to the game. Like I, I didn't see Hellraiser. 
uh i didn't see a lot of like i i snuck watched a lot of horror movies when i was a kid but i wasn't allowed to watch a lot of horror movies when i was a kid and i also was a pussy and i didn't <laughs> a lot of horror movies as a kid hey not everybody Reason. wants to i get scared too like i don't but know I'm... i didn't yeah i didn't really get into them until like i th- i know the ex i saw the exorcist when i was really young but um that one's scary. Oof, that one's doozy as well all right Pete oh, freaking. Yeah. Oh, the shining i still remember i watched the shine that was one of the, my earliest because i watched that on my birthday and i was re- i would have been really young too but, I, but that like one yeah sticks with you. for the most that part one sticks I, with you this one's for the most part i didn't really watch a lot of them yeah but yeah watching that that first kill oh. with the uh marionette juice yeah the veins are gross it looks great and, looks gnarly and it looks great and then that shot of him of freddy in the sky that is just perfect and it's terrifying and it's yeah yeah i love it so we should talk maybe a bit about yep. um so it came out in 87 it was directed by chuck russell um there was a first draft of the script written by wes craven and bruce wagner and <laughs> um bruce wagner he I, I don't know i a lot of people seem to think he did more of the writing in the first draft of the script because it was like very dark very pro Fane and like Freddy Krueger's dropping C bombs and he's talking about how he's gonna shit on really? people's corpses and uh, oh man he's calling one of them like he calls one of the Dream Warriors like a F rhymes with maggot <laughs> and it's uh he wow. Freddy is like it's cranked to ten because I think that's where Wes maybe or Bruce I don't know you know it's tough to say which one wanted but they were he was trying to make it darker right trying to make it to the right. next level where as Chuck Russell said that they wanted to uh, have let's make the third film more fun is what he said and like take the boundaries further which I think is like the the blueprint after this point for pretty much the rest of the series right and kind of the rules you play with with Freddy they're like really right. really cemented in this one and then they add to the mythology right so um, I mm-hmm. think Frank Darabont co-wrote with Chuck Russell, the final draft, and of course he went on to do like The Walking Dead. I think it's yeah, he did a lot of stuff. Recently, everybody's like, yeah, that was like a huge show, right? Um, Mm -hmm. and I thought it was so interesting to hear that Bruce Wagner like talk about at one point he went to a a dinner, um, at Paul Bartel's house, aka the director with Mary Warnoff. Uh, He did. Uh, eating Raul, that really dark comedy. It's so interesting to imagine that. What that? It's good. It's on the Criterion Collection. I liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah I remember it's you, dark, uh, though. It's sending dark. me a picture because they that you had a uh, you had the Criterion of that. Yeah, it's I like it, but it's very dark, and I just I'm imagining what that dinner party must have been like. With you have Wes Craven, Bruce Wagner, so it's like these people who are like intellectual, but also. <laughs> You know, kind of sick in the, some of the stuff that they write. Right. It must have been such like a Paul Bartel makes a movie, which is like, I don't know, a lot of people don't like Eating Well. I do personally because it's like, I just watch it as a dark comedy, right? But they're like, essentially invite people over they're to their bad. house. N- no, they, they kill people, but it's all done in like a comedic way. Essentially, it's like she uses her body to invite men over to like almost pretty much be a prostitute and then has her husband whack them and it's always like comical he just like hits them with a frying pan over the head and gunk, there's like never any blood but it's like kind of a little bit perverse in that sense because it's kind of almost exploitative but i think that's the point of it so it's interesting to see how like right. Wes craven and this guy were <laughs> at a house party and like you know i, kind of, I guess it kind of fits because you know Wes doing last house on the left and you know that yeah. obviously is a really out there movie as well but we won't i find it that. funny that uh craven i find it funny that west craven did porn before yeah. he uh he had like a different name or something <laughs> he went under i think so yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh i don't know how much of his involvement i know that i think they asked him to come back to this one but once they read his script they took some parts of it which i know him and bruce wagner so originally um, what you were saying about the marionette scene, Bruce Wagner talks about his version of that, where he, um, mm-hmm. it's about when, you know, when dads, it's really interesting when he talked about the scene, how his version was and how they changed it. So in his version, there's still kind of the marionetting scene, but in this, how like a small mm-hmm. child will be put on their dad's feet and then the dad will walk around with them kind of like, you know, 
holding their hands, walking with them. You know, how, when you're a little right, kid, you put right. your feet on, or somebody else put your feet, their feet on your feet, and you kind of walk them around, little folks, little kids, if you will. So the idea was that Freddy was yeah. going to take this like fatherly thing and then walk this kid into an oncoming vehicle, essentially. And oh, if he was like a father wow. figure, but he's like walking the kid into like oncoming traffic and kills him. It's almost that they almost uh, touched on that in uh, New Nightmare. Yeah, yeah. That's it's yeah. I don't know if that's a tip of the hat. You know, tough to say because it's Wes Craven doing that one, right? So he's back. He's writing, directing. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe that is kind of his uh, his answer to them not using it. But I know Bruce Wagner. <laughs> he said, "Oh yeah, originally he, it, yeah, he originally wrote that scene, and they thought." He said like, what they did with the veins and everything. He's like, oh, I, I love that even more. Like, the, the, he's, he was like, oh, yeah, they, they improved oh, on it. And it, it is yeah, good because it's, it's like it plays so, with them. It's so much better. Or not better, but like <clears throat> it's just such a horrific hill. Yeah. And uh, to have it s- like start off the movie like that, it's just like, yeah, shit. Like they get it gets into lighter, well, not lighter kills, but like, you know, like – Probably like Dungeons and Dragons, like, uh, <laughs> oh, the, the Wizard. wizard man. Like it gets, yeah. it gets into yeah, pretty fantastical stuff towards the end, and even like the uh, almost like Jason and the Argonauts, like yeah, the John Saxon and yeah. uh, Craig, Craig Moss, yeah, fighting the skeleton of Freddy. Like it, it gets into pretty not like almost fantasy stuff later on, but like that early scene, that that early kill, that yeah, that one's yeah, it's a haunt. It gets a little kooky by yeah. the by the end of it, I think, but. I feel like it really is good. I still think it's a a perfect movie. Freddy's still scary, and the lines that he has in this one, I think Mm -hmm. uh, even Chuck Russell, the director, says that too. It's like it's kind of hard for them to always be, you know, sometimes they wouldn't get it right after this of how funny or, you know, comedical Freddy could be versus how much he should be, right? And in this one, I think you have the perfect mix of that because you have, like, I agree. Yeah. You have the undertone of the kids being troubled and their parents kind of putting them in this quote unquote safe place in this hospital. And you, you feel bad for all of them and you know, something's coming for them. So you have that part of the yeah. story, but then you also have, you conflate people, you know, again, it's the older generation. That's why I thought the Larry Fishburne character was so interesting, right? Because he's not one of the parents. He can kind of see what the kids are talking yeah. about. He generally cares. Yeah, because then you have the other, like you have the other uh, janitor that works there that's trying to hit on the uh, uh, Karen character. I think. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. her name? The the one that ends. Up. And he's yep. a creep, and he like. Yeah, so you have that scene, and it's just like, yeah, that that like shit like this would really happen in these hospitals. So. Yeah, it's a very it's uh, cool how dark. <laughs> it's kind of dark that part. Yeah. It's, it's like holy yeah. shit, these kids are in a bad situation, and even the world around them. Not just Fred Krueger, right? But, like, the yeah. world around them is, like, treating them like shit, too, which I thought was, like, man, this is a pretty... Even, like, the when they go to the junkyard, which I think is such a... I love that scene. It's just, like... I love that You can scene. tell... It's just the... Oh, I love it. It's... They recreated it just before as well. It was so good. Everything about... Yeah, like... <laughs> that's funny, because I, I brought this up last uh, last episode, too, but, like... The junkyard is a level in the NES game too. Oh my god! Which, which I find like the, the NES game, it's LGN, and you all know, or you all know, but like they're the, not good. Um, they're not angry, good. It, yeah, the angry video game nerd has done the LGN, but I think the video game is actually like I I think the video game is good because it has these like you go to the high school, you go to the junkyard, you're collecting Freddy's bones. Yeah, it's it's really really hard, and it's kind of shitty but like it does at least recreate some of the scenes and stuff like that and the junkyard scene is so good yeah i I just love that i love that whole john saxon uh bringing uh bringing him back too yeah that was a great call and i his character is kind of funny in this one because now he's just a drunk and he's like playing it off i love how the other guy uh uh Doctor, what is it? Craig Watson. Yeah, Neil. He gives him the gives him the gears in the bar. You're gonna help me. Flips a table. Like Burrow goes zero to one hundred yeah. real quick. But you can kind of tell, right? <laughs> I think in the original script there was supposed to, um, yeah, in the original version there was a love scene between him and Nancy as well. And ah, uh, you can see that. Yeah, I, can see that. I don't think they needed it though. Yeah, to be honest, like, oh well, no. The target demo, I think, of these like, movies was like 
adolescent like teenage or young adults right so i don't think anybody needs like a a love story in a quote-unquote mm. slasher horror film but you do you do see the connection it's, between them right like you you know it probably well, would have went there and i actually like i think i think craig craig Watson, he's uh his only other big movie was um brian de palma's uh body double okay okay can't remember oh, if i've seen that believe in Oh, it's great. It's great. And actually rewatching this, I forgot Craig Lawson was in this. Yeah. <laughs> like that show is just so long. It, it's been since I watched this. I was like, oh, Craig Lawson. I got I to gotta watch Body Double again now. Yeah, but, he, was, um, he, was, he was good. And I liked his character in this movie too, considering he's a, he's a, a new character. And yeah. He's very sympathetic. And he's like, he doesn't, yeah, he's a new character. And he doesn't believe uh, Nancy at first. And he, he sees the drugs she's on. And then like he, the, the experimental drug and everything. And then like you, I really like his character arc and everything. Oh, and the, uh, the thing with the sister too, the ghost. Yes. Yep. Like where he keeps, he keeps seeing her and his, what I like, what I was thinking about when I watched this, rewatched this is I kind of find it funny that Craig Watson a little bit, kind of little bit looks like Robert England. Okay. <laughs> it, to me, anyway, I don't know for me, like he kind of looks he like just a little you. bit like he just reminds me a little like of Robert England, like without the makeup and everything. And I just thought to my, I was watching and rewatching. And I was thinking to myself, huh, you know what? It would have been like, as much as I love Craig Watson, it would have been uh, impractical. It would have been cool if Robert England played this part. <laughs> and I think he could have. I Holy think he shit. Because like he, like honestly because they like he just reminded me of of him and like they don't yeah they don't look terribly similar and but whatever but like i just i thought i to myself i thought yeah craig Watson kind of looks like he could be his brother he could be uh robert england's brother and like i i i, I just thought of that like while i was rewatching, i was i thought it would have been cool if ralph would have played this part Give him like yeah, give him the part without the makeup because I know most people would, yeah, wouldn't really be like think, no one, no one would have noticed, right? No one would have uh, clued in either. It would have added like, another yeah. reading of the movie too, right? Having the guy who's killing all the people <laughs> yeah. also trying to like <laughs> help them on the other he, side he has it, and fighting with uh, fighting against the skeleton. I, I like yeah, I just I thought that was kind of cool. Like just like that thought like came to me. I was like yeah, it would have been cool to have Robert England. Because in New Nightmare, obviously, he plays himself, and it's funny. He's, like, painting. He's so good. He's so good in that one. Yeah. I but wish they gave him more in that one, one honestly. They should have gave him more in New Nightmare. That's why it came to me, because he is such a good actor outside of playing Freddy that I thought he could have played the uh, Craig Lawson part perfectly. Not to get on a huge uh, side parenthesis or tangent here, but, you know, we're talking about movies and ones that we, uh, you know, love Dream Warriors. Um, side note, though. In New Nightmare, when you have Robert England show up and he's playing himself, it's so funny. The only thing I think that, like, going back and I kind of jump on the shark here again, but um, rewatched that movie a while ago, maybe like six months ago. And right. the only thing that I think they could have done a bit differently, and I hate to say that because obviously I like the movie and all that stuff, I'm not saying with any disrespect, but having, you know, how. Nancy has to see Freddy and Rob Shea is saying that he's getting phone calls from Freddy and everybody, even Robert England saying, yeah, what, since Wes Craven's been writing this script, everybody's been getting these phone calls and that, you know, it's not really Freddy. It's the entity in new nightmare, right? Who taking the shape of mm -hmm. Freddy, but we never see Robert England having to face Freddy. We see him do the painting. That's true. But we never, that is true. the second half of the movie, Robert England's just gone. Remember like Heather Langkamp's calling his phone and she's like, I'm trying to get a hold of Robert after she goes to see Wes Craven. And Robert England's just gone. So we, <laughs> as the view, as the audience, we're kind of like just left to believe, no, he's not cosplaying Freddy in the real world. And it's just like uh, Robert England went crazy. But he's just gone, right? Like, yeah, he never has to. And see, that's, why I just, that's why as much as I like bringing it back, like Craig Lawson as an actor, and he's, he's you need to see Body Double because he's great in Body Double as well. I'll check it out then. I'll put but, it on my uh, list for sure. I love that oh, yeah. body double. Yeah. Brian DePaul. Um, but uh, 
like just watching it, I'm just thinking like he could like Robert England could have played this role so perfectly. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. He disappears in New Nightmare, and he never uh, faces himself. He never faces the uh, the. But uh, Frank yeah. could have got him. I like, feel like I, I don't know. Like I feel mm-hmm. like it, or it could have at least been a really interesting but scene, it right? Cool in, it would have been cool in Dream Warriors, I think, if he had played the part of the Doctor, because I think it it like it would have been perfect for him because he he would have been out of makeup, yeah. just Robert England, and I think the uh, the. Uh, yeah, I did. It would be cool. I I, I do agree. agree. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was actually there is a copy of the original script that's out there, and a lot of the stuff in that script, um, slightly altered death scenes and all this stuff. The D and D character who I freaking when I was a kid I had big pop bottle glasses. They were thick. They're still thick, but with technology, you know, us visually impaired right. folk. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying. They're thick. You're young, and but so they were thick pop bottle glasses, and I identified with that nerdy kid. And when he gets got in this movie, right. oh boy, you're just like you kind of saw it coming, but <laughs> at the same time because you just saw it. It just shows that I haven't seen this movie very often. Like I haven't rewatched it very much because I was saying to myself, "Oh, I think I I, I know I knew obviously Kincaid survived." Yep. And Joey, but I was just like, does Taryn, like, I, I, I can't believe that I didn't know that Taryn, like, that's the big thing is when he injects her, right? And I was like, Taryn lives. No, Taryn lives. And then I was just thinking, like. And she's dying. Like, she needs to die. <laughs> yeah. And then I was just thinking with the uh, the D&D character, uh, what is it, Will? Yeah, Will, played by Ira Heaton. Hayden. Okay, yeah, Will. I was like, oh, he survives. Yeah, he's a cool character, too. He's like, all oh, right. Like, that's the I, that's like no, the brutal didn't. brutal part of it too. It's because like you're rooting for these kids <laughs> to get out of this hospital and overcome <laughs> this, you know, overcome yeah. their, you know, because it's it's obviously hinted at. I think a huge part of the original story um, that Wes and Bruce were talking about. He said you have to take something to the next level, and so where in the original nightmare you have, you know, everybody's by themselves, and Freddy targets you one by one, which. <laughs> I guess it still ends up happening in this movie, but they do fight together in one scene and are fairly well, successful. The cool thing is that they are they are fighting back, and yeah, you don't want them to lose. Yeah, but the kids come together, and then you know they're hopeful. Uh, but originally the the script was a lot darker too. I mean, there's still parts of this, but originally it was about the kids coming to this place at a hospital where they end up committing suicide. But it's Freddy doing it, which is still kind of. In the script, though, right? It's hinted at. Yeah, they, 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 Cause, they say that the uh, the fir- the first kid he jumped off the roof. Yep. And, uh... Yep. Okay, and then the Will, the kid in the wheelchair, the D and D enthusiast, love love yeah. that character. He's so nerdy. I love him. He reminds me of me at that age. Oh my god. Um, just that nerdy Joey. little yeah. Joe, Joey and Kincaid are probably yeah. The Kincaid's OG cool breeze, as Larry Fishburne calls him. Like, goddamn! How does a movie that's you know it's not a bloated runtime, and you have identical, i not identical, identifiable character traits with almost every character in this movie, and you get to yeah. know them at such a yeah. quick time, and then you, you know all bets are off as to who survives. In my mind, yeah, that's why in my mind it's a perfect sequel because it's like, yeah, it's it's only ninety minutes, and there's so much, there's so many characters in it. That yeah, you love all of them. Yep, you identify with a lot of them and it's just it's packed full of yeah it's, it's it's so much fun it is like that's why it's the perfect horror movie in that sense too is that it's horrifying it's funny it's yeah just you really care about all these characters and nancy i love that nancy comes back and she's now an adult yeah and she's a doctor and she's helping these kids because she's been through it and yeah, it solidifies what happens at the end of the first nightmare as well, though, right? Because she says, "Oh yeah, my mom and my friends were killed," but she says it happened six years right. ago. So there is a there is like a time in the timeline. There is a jump um, from the original to this one. So it is viable that she went to school, right? Went mm-hmm. got a yep. you know a, dipl- a degree in something. I forget what she's what she says she went to school for dreams or something like this, but. I can't remember the, what the exact line is when she's talking to Neil about it, but you know, Fred, 
Freddyology. Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> Freddy <Super> 101. <laughs> She's been studying hard on the Krug, man. Oh, jeez. But, like, yeah, there is. It's And, again, like, all bets are off with what kids survive. Even at the end of this one, some people think it's controversial. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, sorry, but not sorry. It's 1987. We're no one watching this. Yes. <laughs> no it's now 2024 right now. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, having Nancy die at the end is quite a fucking statement too, considering that mm -hmm. I, have to, I think that's one other thing, if I'm going to be super nitpicky, not being like eh, no, I don't like it now, but I, it's still, I think, one of the best sequels, if not the best sequel in the, the whole franchise um, having her die at the end, I think is fine, because they give her a hero send-off right, it's not just like, oh, she's they do, and she, she and I saving them. Yeah. And saving Kristen so yeah. yeah. It's just I feel like the whole trap that Freddie you know, takes the shape of her father. I feel like Nancy would see that as a trap. Like uh, the character from Okay, I, You know what I mean? Like I feel like Well, he, I can see that. I I I totally especially since she's dedicated her so life much time, to, yeah. You know, like Yeah. She knows so I can, I can, how tricky Freddy can be right and to me it's just yeah. like they're still in the dream world because Kristen brought them in right she's sedated she brings them in so they're stuck mm -hmm. in there and then essentially after Joey finally finds his voice and screams and break all the hallway mirrors and all the kids horny, are released horny Joey yeah horny, horny. Joey poor, poor Joey eh? side side note poor <laughs> Joey sexy nurse scene you know he's just getting excited and sexy nurse turns into Freddy, and it just looks so silly too. There's like behind the scenes photos of the lady, who she's like topless, but like originally it was gonna be like a whole shot of like, an, the lady who is the sexy nurse dressed up at, yeah. in Freddy makeup. So originally it was like no half naked woman with a Freddy Krueger head acting like she's Robert England playing Freddy Krueger, and it just there's back behind the scenes footage. It just looks outlandish and. Thank God they didn't go that route, but Joey just gets, you know, you ha this is where you have to be like, Freddy's kind of at his most cerebral. He's fucking with this kid, teenager over his sexuality. Like, well, that's a funny thing. That's the funny thing you said about the the original script having the F A G G O T word. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, man. It's he, he, makes out, he makes out with this kid. Yeah. He's, he's, Every time, like the line in the movie Kincaid earlier says, remember when they're talking in the in the room? He's like, Oh yeah, it's uh, the one doctor. I forget her name. You know, the older, the older doctor who's kind of like the mean one, the nurse yeah. ratchet type bitch. You know, she's she's not doing, she's not uh, looking out for the kids. She thinks she is, but she's kind of like. I think that's where a lot of the the subtext of this movie is like really good too, because it's like the kids were prescribing them stuff just like in the eighties when Prozac and all this shit came out, right? So that you're mm -hmm. the, the, the the rich parents, and you especially see it with uh, Kristen, Patricia Arquette's character in the opening scene. It Freddie is at least staging his attacks if he doesn't kill the kid to make it look like they're trying to take their own life. So the parent throws them exactly. away and they put them in this hospital and they're prescribing them drugs that they're just and all the kids are trying to do is say no, there's something else here, but they don't want to listen, right? So I think that's like mm -hmm. it. It still ties into the first one in that sense. And elevates it to the sense of like you know adding the religious symbology as well. I don't know; it's a little. Well, I love that. I love that with the nun and just talking about Freddie, like, like she was raped by what? What was hundred maniac uh, maniacs or something? Yeah, the maniac. bastard son of a hundred. It ad adds to the lore, right? Because we don't know that in the it, the first film, does, we didn't know about that. It adds to lore in a sense that the, part two, again, like. Not bad. <laughs> just just it, 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 it is what it is. A, de a definitely unique movie. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot better. But like, this is just perfect for me because it just yeah, it adds to the lore. It adds to the character at a Freddy Krueger character and like just having the the like the the mom, the the nun, the ghost nun. Yeah, Amanda Spoiler. Krueger. But, uh, Those scenes are Amanda nice Kruger. too because they kind of break up. They, it's you know it is a lot of in these scenes exposition, but 
it's mm-hmm. handled so well. It's like a haunted house, right? Like he sees an imagery up in the, up in the tower, so he goes and like chases her down. And then you got the nice pian, the perfect. They just splice those piano yeah. pieces in here. That remember when he sees her the first time when after he's done talking to Nancy, he sees her amongst yep. the crowd of people, and then she's gone. So it's like it's got that ethereal nightmare. I don't know. It just feels like yeah. Well, is this real? You know, you're starting to wonder <laughs> if he's seeing a ghost. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, by the end we know. But right. it's so, like, it works in the context of the movie and what these kids are going through as well. Even this other guy is getting haunted and kind of, you know, it's not specifically explained why she's speaking to him. But other than, you know, the bones must be laid to rest and that's what they do at the end of the movie, right? That's how they defeat him with the holy water and the, laying him to rest as he should have been originally, which by part four doesn't freaking matter at all. He's resurrected by a dog pissing fire in the classic words of Rennie Harlan, right? <laughs> I think they were saying that James Cameron was in, in, at New Line, and that was like the anecdote. <laughs> James Cameron and it was like in New Line Cinema, and they're like filming or getting ready to film part four. And he asked Freddie Harlan, so how are you bringing Freddie back this time? He's like, a dog pisses fire. <laughs> but like in his Swedish or fin, Finnish <laughs> accent. Freddie Harlan directed part four. Yeah. I forgot Freddie Harlan directed part four. Mr. Cliffhanger, Die Hard 2, <laughs> Deep Blue, Deepest Bluest. <laughs> My hat is like a shark's fin, Deep Blue Sea. Sam Jackson. Uh, long kiss, long kiss, good night. He like Rennie Harlan's, yeah, stacked. He, he just directed stuff. The Stranger, which I heard he just, wasn't uh, direct- too hot. Oh, they're apparently terrible. Jeez. Strangers. Uh, Sorry, Rennie. Chapter one. Listening to yeah, <laughs> I heard it got pretty trashed. Sorry, Rennie. I, I, I had a ticket. You threw. I had a ticket for it, but I funded it. Because you heard how bad it was. I heard it was yeah. just like a remake of the original. That, like nothing. Doesn't do anything really new. Exactly. And I don't. I, I remember seeing the trailer and thinking, huh, this just looks like a remake of the original. Yeah. We're getting off track here. But it's, um, uh, it's another side note. The, I, I don't like the, I don't like the original Strangers uh, that much. I think it's, it's a cool concept. But um, the sequel, I think, was great. I don't even think I've ever seen it, but I I've seen bits and pieces. I know for sure. Pray pray at night or pray by night or whatever, but uh, no, it's it's actually really good uh, about a family fighting back and the brother and sister. I like I I I think the sequel is awesome. So when I saw it, yeah, they're making a new Strangers. I was like, oh cool, you're pumped. And then I watched the trailer. Yeah, I watched the trailer and I was like, oh, no, it geez. just looks like the original movie. <laughs> but apparently they're making. Apparently he made. They're making three of them. Oh, he's planned. They're planning a trilogy, just like uh, the David Gordon Green, the Exorcist trilogy. Had that. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, dog shit at the box office. So I doubt. What? Oh, I don't know. It's so part interesting two. too, eh? Because I think they're just not doing part two, or I heard somewhere this might be on one of those bait sites that somebody else is just taking another. Oh, yeah. yeah, at a new one. That's what I heard. But uh, no, what's his name? Uh, he's a he's a really good director. God damn, he did. Um, oh, why can't I think of his name? I know, oh, I read it somewhere. Oh, Mike Flanagan. Is that Mike Flanagan? Flanagan, thank you. Yeah, Mike Flanagan's taking over. He's taking over. So, is he finishing the new Exorcist trilogy, or is he just doing a new one? I, I didn't understand. He's like just doing a, doing a new. One. I didn't really understand either. I don't know if he's because like they had a trilogy planned, right? And. They did so. The first one yeah, did so like, poorly, you know, or whatever. People didn't like it, right? So, I don't think oh, it, was, it makes sense to continue that oh, if it, it if it wasn't <laughs> well received. I never. I, I gosh, admittedly, gosh. I'm judging it from just what I've heard, so I can't. Oh, I'm, well, I'm sure it is dog sure. shit, though. I didn't like. Yeah, I, I I don't typically trust a lot of people that I watch on YouTube, but I you know I gather bits and pieces from different sources and then kind of make my own. I should just watch it so I can finally you know say i watched it's it bad. but i think it's when freaking said he <laughs> freaking said whoever makes an exorcist, exorcist i'm going to haunt before he passed away and i think i think that's come to fruition because that looked like a I, judging by how it's received and the, you know just the metacritic scores and everything the letterbox it's a lot of people give it the gears that was the thing about the uh, again we're getting off to- topic but like that was the thing about the uh halloween the uh trilogy the new trilogy yeah is that like yeah jamie lee curtis was coming back for the first time so obviously it's going to make a boatload of money and it ended on a so and then part obviously part two is going to make a boatload of money yep and then 
uh, part three. But like with the Exorcist, it's Ellen Burstyn. Yeah, it's like people. It's not the people same. Are going to be like oh, Ellen Burstyn's coming back for the Exorcist. Like <laughs> we always like, we always somehow get back to this too. Eh? It's just like what I, I don't feel like she was. I'm not saying not as instrumental as Jamie Lee Curtis, but great in the exorcist. But when you like, when you think of the exorcist, you know, like of Ellen Bernstein, like, Oh, she's coming back. And like, you don't need three new, three new exorcist movies. You don't need. No. And no, <laughs> it, it like, it, it was, it was terrible. It was so bad. But anyway, back to uh, Nightmare. <laughs> back to uh, what, are they, what this episode's about. Nightmare three dream warriors, you know, right. Oh man, yeah. I, you know what? Admittedly, too, before we said we're doing the nightmare films and we agreed to it, I yep. hadn't sat down and watched Dream Warriors in quite some time. Like I, for me, I put some of these movies on in the background just when I'm like doing stuff, like editing on my computer or you know, just in the background for background noise right. because I've seen these so many times, right? And sitting down and actually watching well, it front to back this time was like, you know what? Hey, it is thing. good. That's the exciting thing for me is that I haven't watched them too many times. Like I've seen the original, probably the, I, I'd say the original and new nightmare. I've probably seen the most. Yeah. But the sequ- sequels, I haven't really watched that, very much. Yeah. There's a lot of them, right? And some are, if you don't know, some of them are better, some worse. Right. And so you kind of, yeah. I, for me, I remember the f- very first time I've seen this movie. Um, I was enthralled with it, but I was able to get a copy, and this is just dating myself quite badly. But like, I got a copy of this one. I remember I told you I watched it at my uncle's house originally on a like a recording yeah. of it. Well, I was able when I finally was able to procure my own copy. It was for buying it from like a freaking Canadian tire. In the small town I lived in, because this was a VH, VHS copy tire. on a Cana- Canadian Tire had Dream Warriors for like ten bucks. They sold. They sold movies they sold at Canadian movies? Tire. Movies. Well, it's a small town, That's right? Insane. So it was, and so I had part one. Wow. I had ordered from Columbia House. I had a double VHS. I wish I still kept that. My God, well, you're so stupid when you're younger, right? You just oh, some stuff. That's probably a lot worth a lot. That's probably worth a lot. There's a whole thing about uh, VHS uh, horror movie collectors. Yeah, but at how much? I know he's he does. God, he had a copy. He bought a copy of Dream Warriors on VHS at like, I think the. Uh, horror convention in London, Ontario, Con- or Shockstock, I think. Yeah. A buddy of mine, he Shock Stock, <laughs> he yeah. posted a picture and he he had Nightmare Three Dream Warriors with. It even says with a little sticker on it. I don't know if this was originally on there or not, but I know the movie did come with it because my copy did do the music video with Doc and Dream Warriors, which is like you know part of the legacy now too. That band still plays that song when they're <laughs> when they do concerts oh, live. Like it's one of their classic songs. Like everybody that's the singer don dawkin from band he's talking about it in the never sleep again documentaries like yeah they ask us to play that every time like whenever we go out and you can find videos online when they're playing it recently in like the last 10 years like it's the videos fromage right you can tell they're just zooted out of their mind on drugs <laughs> i think that's <laughs> the one thing that they didn't uh another funny antidote robert england's talking about that um yeah they're Remember the in the I don't know if you've seen the music video, but they pretty much used like the set from the snake scene and like the the boiler room and the bands playing in there and they're kind of the bands coming together to fight fright. It's very cheesy, but they use a lot of like the sets from the movie. And instead of like the snake or Kincaid busting through the wall, it's the guitar player George Lynch and he just busts into the huge guitar solo. And he <laughs> he's like you could just see it like he's like oh yeah I'm high as shit they were doing like bumps of coke off Freddy Krueger's razor gloves with Robert Anglin behind the scenes because it's like eighty seven right this is just they right. they try to like gloss by it when they're talking about it in the the Robert Anglin documentary about his whole career but it's like yeah he was like a bit of a wild guy for a while but I mean that's the eighties right coke was cool in the 80s. it was yeah coke was cool and you could just see it in the video it's hilarious but I was like I remember after I got that VHS from Canadian Tire and took it home. My mo- point of the story is I watched the whole movie. The movie ends with that song as the credits play. And then if you watch the movie Great. until the credits Great. are over, 
then you get the music video, which is so freaking cool. And I was running around singing that song, high pitched, little kid, you know, because it because <laughs> it, it ties because it ends like on of like a the song is like about fighting and you know we're, we're together and we're the dream warriors and it's like a lot of the kids got mucked by Freddy in this movie, right? <laughs> but yeah. it, it ends like kind of on an uplifting. Yeah, and it you does. and you do have Joey, you have Kincaid, you have Chris, and I, you know, I haven't really talked about the characters individually uh, a lot yet, but like Kincaid is, I think, my freaking favorite man. Ken Sagos, or I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's he's he doesn't say so much in this movie, but god damn his performance, oh, he's awesome, and he's awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's With the one so guy. Much- I'll fight you, Freddy. Where are you? <laughs> When they're in Which the so much more cool in part four because like we'll get we'll get to that next week and like for part four but yeah. like it's just like why why I know it's you know we can't we can't fault part three for that I can fault part four for that because it's just it felt like yeah. cheap cheap writing and I think even mm-hmm. like the guy who plays Joey what's his name I always forget Joey's name the actor uh, plays... Rodney Eastman yeah Rodney Eastman yeah I like Joey and Kincaid I like uh, those three characters and. Kristen are all really cool characters, and you know they by the end of the movie they're all connected. Uh, sorry, I had to burp there. Um, and <laughs> you know Joey's has like he's <laughs> getting cock blocked by Freddy, and Kincaid's awesome, and then both dying in part t- part four, and even you know it's not just her cat playing Kristen, but her character dying too is just like no Tuesday uh... Tuesday night, yeah. Tuesday night, yeah. Like what were the? But like it just felt yeah. so cheap. I know. Uh, Kincaid, uh, uh, Ken Say goes. He goes on the Never Sleep Again documentary again. The documentary of the whole series being made. He's like, he, when the movie came out in theaters, he just said, All right, "Well, I didn't know they were even going to call me back for this one." So you know, him and Rodney Eastman were happy to get the call back. And that Ken Say goes, goes. If I told my friends if they were going to the theater, do not get popcorn, do not get a drink, get your ass in the seat because my ass will be dead before you even get into the theater to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he just warned his friends like yeah don't don't show up at the last you know don't show up late buddy because like it, it's so and Rodney Eastman I think says it too he's like it felt like a cheap trick and it, it does feel yeah. like you bring yeah. these characters back they're sent to me I get it it's a slasher movie you don't need a hundred people surviving by the end right but also but, I mean, yeah that's the cool thing about like legacy characters like with the scream uh, recalls or whatever where you have Courtney Cox getting killed or like in, in, the, in the screen movie, like spoiler. I, I don't know. It just seems. Yeah. Spoil, whoop, <laughs> spoiler. It just seemed like, um, well, yeah, it just seemed like a, it, it's a cheap shot when you bring them back for the next movie and then you kill them right away. Like I, I would have been okay. I think I would have been okay with like maybe Kincaid dying later in the movie. Cause it would have been more shocking. Right. But like, Killing them off right away, it's just like, yeah, okay. Yeah. They didn't really do too much. They didn't they don't do too much in part four, which is like it it doesn't take away, but it just makes part you know what I mean? When you have a shitty like I don't want to say shitty because I still think part four's got some good things. It's not bad. It's a nicely shot. I don't remember four a lot, so I'm I'm really looking forward to watching part four because I don't remember it a lot, but I like obviously five and six. Yeah. 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 Four is like very visually pleasing and lots of crazy camera stuff and like nice edits. I think a lot of people refer to that as like the MTV. Robert Englund like said, I think, uh, about part four. He's like, oh, this is the MTV Nightmare on Elm Street film. So that's where he kind of got his. I think he was starting to get burnt out by this point. No pun intended, Fred. But he was like getting <laughs> he was getting burnt out by freaking doing the you know the makeup prosthetics <laughs> and like oh, oh, the yeah. call time and that must have been brutal and having to work in that for what twelve you know they have tight timelines like this was not a huge budget movie but it does look like it had more than a four million dollar four and a half million dollar budget like the some of the sets and I know like can't go without oh, saving all the practical effects in this movie. Like and the snake, oh my god! The large Freddy phallic oh, snake. Because Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice came out in '88, and like Beetlejuice used the, uh, the same like kind of snake, esque thing that Freddy does, but yeah, yeah, man, it's it's crazy. And uh, Kevin Yeager, he was the one who did Freddy's makeup part too. He comes back, and he's in charge of the whole thing this time. And Mac, like, we can't go without talking about the special effects of this movie. Like, how many? 
the the set oh, design great. and the, the how much they made are great and... the yeah the the special effects too like how many special effects are in such a <laughs> the, the cinematographer uh, Roy Wagner he's talking about it and he he like anecdotally said dropped the line like oh yeah the budget ever effects got everything he's like camera department <laughs> you know in terms of the budget of the movie like the effects got everything but like you're having effects almost in every every time you're in a dream every, right every almost every scene in yeah. this movie has an effect like the like when Taryn gets the hypodermic needle arm scene the freaking mouth moving on her arm like they're trying to suckle on the right, right it's yeah. so gross and creepy but it's a practical effect and you know all the stuff with like Oh, like the arms remember when he gets Kristen and like the first scene as well the arms like his hands yeah. coming out of like yeah. the pipes and the in the and it doesn't like it yeah it looks you can look at it and you know it's really there you kind of know like it's at that time in the 80s where you know it's not really freddy <laughs> but it's like i don't know it's got a, it's got a nice it's realistic looking but there's something not quite real about it you know what i mean there's some great effects like the cutting Absolutely. the cutting on Joey's Remember when he writes on his chest, come and get him, bitch? Like, that scene. Oh, my God. Come get him, bitch. Yeah, like, even that scene. Like, yeah. Now that would all be CG, and it looks good. Like, you can kind of tell if you, like, pause it and you have a Blu-ray copy. Yeah. You can kind of tell where the prosthetics are. But it looks good enough that it gets it doesn't detract, and the movie's got so many effects and things like that. Like, it's got to be the star of the movie other than, like, just the performances, and Robert Englund as Freddy in this movie is fantastic. Um Absolutely. still a perfect mix like i still find him pretty frightening in this movie like the whole scene yeah, when like he, he comes in the house right freddy's home with the little girl saying, even when he's saying welcome to prime time bitch like even that like it's not really it's like uh it's not really even that funny it's it's kind of just like oh this shit yeah because she's dead yeah, he right shoves her, <laughs> yeah, he, shoves, he shoves her head into the fucking tv and like you feel bad for that character too because she she wants to be a star and she's you know like that's what's so good about this this like, one too. That started to introduce that, right? Like Freddie, um, in the first one, it's just kind of like you're in dreams and you're not sure when you are sometimes. But then fantastic things start to happen. But in this one, Freddie starts to go after things that are personal to you, right? Like mocking the girl about the television, and then, right. and when uh, the the D and D character drug overdose, yeah, yeah drug overdose with Taryn, D and D character being in a wheelchair. He says, when you wake up, it's back in the saddle again. It's so fucking cruel. And then the kid dies. It's yeah. Like, so it is like, <laughs> sure he has one-liners, but he's still very dark and. Exactly. He's yeah. a he's a force in this movie. He's he's. It's not like he's a fun broom. Yeah, he's not he's not gone that far yet. And like yeah, like we were saying about like the the plot of the the suicides in the original draft as well. There's still bits and pieces of that, right? Because Freddy is setting it up like when you when you see Kristen when Kristen finds or her mother finds her, right? She's got the razor in her mm -hmm. hand, but in the dream it was Freddie getting her. And then when the kid gets marionetted, the people, the the doctors jumped think, oh, yeah. he jumped, and then he, he just yeah. jumped. He he gave up. That's what you know. The doctor, Doctor Neil Gordon, oh, thinks. yeah, he says he gave yeah. up. And then and then Will, the D and D character, is in the wheelchair. He's like, no, I saw him up there. He was awake. And so you have those like underlying tones, and then also like even on the radio. That's mean for me. Yeah, 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 that scene for me, like where they're all screaming at him, like to wake up all the kids. Yeah, it's just like that scene is is perfect. Yeah, it's in terms of Nightmare on Elm Street kills. Like, yeah, it's yeah, he gave up, but yeah, they all knew. they know he didn't give up, right? Just like how people are gonna say, "Oh yeah, these kid two kids just gave up in the last day, and now another one's in a coma." They're just that we know something's going on here, right? And I right. think I think it's interesting too because i put the subtitles on when i watched this time just to see if i missed anything and like when you meet larry fisher mm -hmm. when he's walking you know when he's walking to max when he's walking down the hall and you're getting introduced to dr neil gordon even on the radio like the rate on the the background radio as they're just walking and talking in the hallway and you're getting to meet the characters the radio is like saying something like uh just talking about two kids suicides it's <laughs> like it's Oh wow! It's in the yeah the radio when Larry Fishburne is introduced. Two more teenage deaths have occurred, both suicides. That's on the radio, and then Doctor Gordon or Max, one of them says, "Oh, real uplifting news to start the day." So there is bits and pieces of 
you know, I guess there's a lot of movies in the 80s or like late 80s and early 90s that kind of dealt with suicide and things like that. But like, mm. I think it's still in the script here. And there is an original copy of the original draft by Wes and Bruce Wagner that you can read is out there. Um, but that, that's the one that's like very dark version. And I don't think I don't think they wanted to go that route because I read some of the stuff and it's right. like the D&D character is still in it. And a couple of things are different, but like the scene with the D and D character fighting Freddy is ludicrous on paper. Like I don't know how they would have shot it because I was interested, right? Because I play Dungeons and Dragons. I like I like some nerdy stuff. I don't I don't mind some right. nerdy stuff here and then rolling some dice with some friends, have some fun, whatever. And um, I looked, so I you know my curiosity: how would they do the scene compared to what they did in the movie? Which it's what it is, right? He gets chased by a demonic wheelchair. I think that. <laughs> That's, yeah, I think that's probably the most, like, outrageous scene in the movie where it gets into the uh, later, like, yeah. ridiculousness. But, like, yeah, but... I, can, I guess it could still be that's... something he doesn't like, but in the original draft, he's, like, the rules are, like, Freddy can just shapeshift into, like, anything. He's, <laughs> like, the wizard master turns into, uh, a, like, a, <laughs> like, a gargoyle or some shit, and then Freddy turns into no, a crow. Right. And they have a fight in like different forms. And then the wizard master, after he turns into Freddy, turns into a crow to try and peck his eyes. The wizard master turns from a gargoyle into like a big. I don't know how they would have filmed this. It's like ludicrous. He's like becomes like a net to try and put the the crow in a net, like you caught a bird. And then the bird Freddy crow turns into like goo and goes through the net. And then he becomes a human form again. And then Freddie takes like a gas powered Freddie runs from, from around the corner or something with like a gas powered hole digger and drives it through his chest. And then he says, screw you to the kid. I'm like, this is the dumbest. I don't know who wrote that scene. <laughs> like if that was that Wes or was it Bruce? But like, how the, f how the hell would you film that? I guess it's kind of like oddly dark, but this, that's, Right. <laughs> the final scene's also pretty damn stupid. I don't believe in fairy tales. Oh my god. That part yeah. kills me. Years and years, super small side tangent, years and years ago I did an edit of that on uh, on an old YouTube account and <laughs> I just did a dumb edit where Freddy goes to kill the Wizard Master again. It, the whole scene plays the same. But my whole caveat was at the end when he says, sorry kid, I don't believe in fairy tales, I cut to Aragorn from Lord of the Rings running and cue the Lord of the Rings soundtrack and he's running in to save the wizard master and sliced in the scene of Aragorn swinging the sword Strider, you know, they call him Strider. He swings the sword and I take the shot of Freddy getting decapitated from Freddy vs. Jason and spliced it together. The stupidest video That's I've hilarious. ever made. Some people got really mad about it in the comments. I think I occasionally check really? and every, every once in a while they're like, oh, why'd you edit it? Or I think the best comment I read, because I just go back and look at it, right? It's got a lot of views for some reason. I guess it, that scene's not a lot of places on YouTube, so some people are really pissed off when they go to watch the original scene. Because I don't, you know, I didn't, in the description, I'm not like, plus Lord of the Rings. I just let the scene play out as it is in the movie. And at the last second when he's about to, you know, kill the kid, as he says... Sorry, kid, I don't believe in fairy tales. Then Strider comes in, and you, the whole... Some people are like, I thought the, the virgin was supposed to survive the horror film. Because <laughs> he's a D&D &D player. <laughs> oh, man, it's fucking funny. I think I even saw, like, I don't know if it was actually him, but I saw a, a name, like the real Ira Hayden, or Hayden, or however you pronounce his last name. I apologize. He was like, right, somebody right. said something's like... And I think he, it was either somebody with a fake account or it's him commented on that video, which is like, that's kind of fucking funny. No way. I know, I know he still goes out to like conventions and stuff. And a lot of these guys from like the dream warriors and the nightmare movies like do like panels, right. When they go to conventions and stuff. So it would be kind of cool yeah. to, to meet them one day, but I've only ever met Robert out of the whole, I've got a lot of autographs from this series that I've, got over the years but i never met anybody in person other than robert but that was we already talked about that before hey that's old news well that's that's the important one right yeah and he was he was a a gentleman on that day um yeah so i guess we're just riffing here for a minute um if anybody's still listening out there thanks again hit the subscribe button leave a comment let us know what you thought dream warriors <laughs> we just kind of jumped Fucking into this one love it
Yeah. Fucking love it. Fucking love it. To see, oh, talk uh, about it for another. Uh, it's a well shot movie too. Now we got it. It's a well is. shot movie. It's so well shot and like it's moody. Yeah, yeah. It's it's dark. It's fun. It's creepy. Man, I wish I could have seen. I it would have scared the bejesus out of me. Like I said, it did even when I was little. But like sometimes I wish yeah, I would have been born ten years, years prior. My twenties, but like I'd love to yeah. see this in the theaters, like for the first time, the reaction because it feels like it'd be a fun popcorn movie because you wouldn't you don't know who's gonna live right it brings back old characters that's why i think what you said early early on is like it's the nightmare movie it's because it does a perfect for me the reason i think it's probably the best sequel in the original like out of all of them right like other than if you count west craven's new nightmare i really like that one a lot too but this one brings old characters introduces new characters and a lot of these characters carry over for the next movie or two right or they have like an ongoing like dr- some of the dream warriors show up in part four and i think that says a lot like we'll be it's such a good movie we'll yeah be into the next. yes and i think it says a lot too right like the fact that you bring the characters back for the next one that's something a lot of these yes they do die <laughs> which pisses me off to no end. I feel like they could have yep. had much more heroic deaths. Other than Kristen. Kristen's all right, but that's a whole nother, you know. Well, it's, it sucks that it's not. True. It sucks that it's not Patricia Arquette again. They even talked about that. Back. I think uh, they said it was like written on the paper for the script in part four. It's like an old, like, you know, the gang meets up on paper. Kristen, Joey, and Kincaid meet up again. And it's like this heartfelt right. reunion. And the actors were just like, it was hard to fake it because it's like, they, I guess on Dream Warriors, you know, it's a low budget thing. So the days are long. You, you form a, a bond with these people, right? They're young actors. They probably hung right. out a lot on set, all this stuff. So I, I'm sure it was kind of a letdown. I think it is for the fans too. And that's not anything against Tuesday night. It's uh, the, for whatever reason. Was, she, was, was Patricia Arquette uh, interviewed for... Uh the documentary she's not she's one of the ones who isn't in the documentary so well and see and that, that that's funny that i, I don't know I, maybe she, maybe she used it as like a jumping you know a lot of actors at this time used horror movies as like their springboard to get more fame right i don't yeah, know if that's what she did it's kind of shitty it's kind of shitty that she didn't um at and least acknowledge it i don't like, know if she disowns it or not. i don't know if she disowned it or not know. Maybe like she does it's it's kind of funny that like Johnny Depp came back for part six just to do a cameo. Yeah, and then and then Wes Craven was too shy to ask him to do New Nightmare. Then he was like, talk to him later. He's like, oh yeah, I would have done it. It's Wes Craven, man. You're like you gave yeah, me he my was. start. <laughs> like, he would he's he's pretty cool like that when people aren't shitting on his bed and he's got a clear oh, mind, you know. So it's like, <laughs> like you you said the last time, the worst thing to happen in bed. Uh, I got yeah, yeah, I got. Funny Johnny Depp uh, anecdote. I got him to autograph my uh, DVD copy of What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Was this at a... in Toronto? Yeah, at, at, at TIFF. No. And I didn't realize until later he drew a swing on my DVD of it. Oh my God. Because the DVD has him and uh, has him and Leo. Uh, on the front? Like, yeah, on the front. And Leo's up in the tree. And Johnny Depp literally drew a line down from the tree and then into his signature. So that's pretty, pretty cool. crazy. That's pretty but, cool. I like Yeah, it. he was he was super nice when I met him. And it's, that it's, whole Amber Heard thing, that was sad. Uh, I met her too. Some debauchery going on there for sure. She, just... she wasn't very nice. No? She, she wasn't, wasn't nice. She wasn't nice on. No. Yeah, they must have gotten to some serious. She was wearing, she was wearing nice perfume when I met her. smelled nice, yeah. Well, that's that's the cover up. What goes on behind the scenes? Who knows? Um, yeah, but it was it's kind of weird. Yeah, I don't know if she's ever come out and said she you just won't talk about this movie or something. But I think she's good in it, and it's kind of sad that she doesn't come back for part four. It's it, it is, and and like she did True Romance, and she is a good actress. Like she's such a good actress, and True Romance, so it's good. just weird. What is her name in oh, that yeah. movie? It's, it's like just... oh god, I can't... Dakota or no Alabama, Alabama, oh, Alabama Warley, Alabama. something. Yeah, that's such a fun movie. Um, side notes all aside, though, the movie, I, I still like the look of it. It's very <laughs> 80s. Like, I don't know. It's just got, like, a nice <laughs> aesthetic. You could tell it's low budget, it's so but they make the most out of it. Really I love the, how 80s it is. Yeah. The cinematographer does a great job. Some of the shots, again, using, 
like at the haunted house at the beginning when Freddy's home and you see his shadow chasing down the wall before you ever get to really see him. Right. Right? So you still have, he is still a f- <laughs> scary when he's, when she's got her feet stuck in the, the stuff, like a call back to the original stair sequence with the muck where yep. Nancy gets stuck and then you have Patricia Arquette getting stuck and he's running up behind her. That scene inspired one of the worst nightmares I think I've ever had in my life. And this was only going back like somewhere in the last 10 years or so. I had this dream and it was like, this is a huge side tangent. Anyone just skip two minutes if you don't want to hear this stupid shit, but I've, it's a personal anecdote, so... <laughs> It was Nightmare 3 Freddy, and I dreamt of Freddy. And in my de- in my dream, I was kind of in like a his house with those long, dark corridors. And, you know, in right. the basement, kind of like what happens in the opening scene of Dream Wars, you know, Kristen in the basement. But in this version, the walls kept winding, and it was like a, a maze. And it was Techno Ray Freddy. And the, the music... No kept, way. It, it was almost like when you marry Annette's, the kid, right? You have that... Ooh, Ooh, with like that oh, coming in and out, that the music. Right. But it was more of like a techno beat, and it kept increasing in speed. <laughs> and Freddy just kept, he's coming down the hallway after me, and the lights are changing, and I'm constantly, it was, oh, and then, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my partner, she made me a painting of that techno ray Freddy's on my office wall now. It's pretty awesome. Oh, I've seen that. That's yeah, that's awesome. it's all colorful yeah. and like watercolor. It's, it's amazing. But Freddy is scary in this movie. Like the scene that I watched, he is. that kept me up at night when I watched at my cousin's house was when he cut the head off of Kristen's mother. And like I said, that scene scared the bejesus out of me. I was certain Freddy was going to show up from around a corner in my house and just cut my head off when I was a kid. And I was like, my my little cousin, my younger cousin. <sighs> He was fine, and I was just like, he was snoring, and I was just like sitting there, like my imagination running wild. I don't know why. Like I was old enough to know it was you know make believe, and it didn't really happen. But I guess that's the magic of you know <laughs> being a kid and imagination, and I couldn't. That's the fun of being scared. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's uh, you can't recreate that, right? It's it's a very tough, no. tough one. It's a dream. Why this movie? Why this movie is so perfect too? It yeah, you can't can't. Uh, talk about Nightmare on Elm Street without talking about Dream Warriors. I think it is, I was kind of, to be honest, like I said, I didn't watch it a lot in the last few years. I just maybe sometimes put it on the background. I finally sat down and watched right. the whole thing this time and paid attention. <laughs> and I I kind of fell in love with it all over again and like how good yep. and... Oh, I was, I was so, I loved my rewatch of this. I don't think, yeah. <laughs> it's a very hard formula to get. Like 4 has some good elements that but I think um, I can't remember if it was Rachel Talalay who we talked who would go on to direct part six or Sarah Reicher. One of them were talking about it. And I, th- I think it's Rachel Talalay. She said all the things that worked in part three, I think she was in charge of overseeing that some of the stuff that worked in part three would continue into part four, which I think is very clear, right? You have the karate guy doing all that stuff. And we start to see that blueprint where Freddie knows you're, desires and your weaknesses and maybe you know he feasts on that he you know uses it to it's cat and mouse right which is the part again we'll talk about when we do part four but pisses me off when you watch this is like a i'd love to watch dream warriors and have part four this is going to sound like a diss but it's just how i feel so sue me film club you know they're coming after us now with pitchforks but if part four could have been more like part three in terms of like still being dark. Whereas like, yes, Freddie is it's cat and mouse. Right. And to th- think like Joey Kincaid, Kristen, they survived their first encounter with Freddie and then they just all get off in the next one. It's the cat and mouse thing. It's like, well, it's just watching them as a double feature. Like I said, part, like it part four would, would have been, movie. it would have been better. It would have been better if they had maybe like, I don't know, like Justin Kincaid had been killed off like midway through part four or uh, yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that. somebody like something, something like, different, right? Something more heroic. Yeah. Like Nancy, yeah, she yeah, dies yeah. in this movie, but at least it's a hero. I mean, apart from my little nitpick, I think it's like a reasonably yeah, yeah. heroic way to go. And um, yeah, uh, it's, it's tough, man. I know in the original um, version of the script too, for part three, the ending was a little different. Neil 
Neil is like having dinner with Kristen and they're talking and like Kristen asks Neil if he still talks to her and he's referring to Nancy and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to go dream. He's like looking forward to sleeping that night. Uh, this is after they defeated Freddy, but Nancy's still dead. Right. And then Neil, the Dr. Gordon character is like, yeah, I'm going to go talk to her tonight. So he talks to her in his dreams. And I thought that was so interesting, interesting because you have like the house, that right? Cool. Cause they're doing like the, the cool popsicle stick house throughout the movie and how it's kind of like right. a gateway almost to the, <laughs> to the dream world. It's alluded to, right, with the light turning on and what's going on in there. And I thought that was so cool, like, where they could have done with maybe Heather Langkamp, potentially. I mean, I'm not sure if it would have been a good idea or not, right? It's, you know, these ideas can sound interesting on paper, but how they play out is one other thing, right? How they're executed. But the idea of maybe having Heather as, like, a, an ongoing character, almost like a spiritual guide in the dream world or some shit. You know what I mean? Like, the how the Insidious oh, movies... Yeah, that... Where, like, she's still helping the kids, but it's just, like, almost like the Amanda Kruger character in, in this one, right? Where she's, like, she's kind of helping them by telling them where, like, his bones were never put aside, right? They weren't buried properly, and that's why he's still haunting the dreams. Have Heather as almost like a, I don't want to say ghouly character, but, like, more of, like, a... A, like a, a ghost, a force ghost type character who shows up and helps the kids when they're <laughs> when Freddy comes back inevitably, right? Which would be cool. Yeah, that is cool. And then you watch part four and a dog pisses fire and Kid K gets got and I just, <laughs> yeah, I guess that doesn't, I shouldn't talk about it too much because we'll get to that. But yeah, Dream Warriors is awesome and I love all the characters in this movie. Um, after rewatching it, yeah, I kind of fell in love with it all over again. I think it's, it's great. I wish it's there was good. more movies of this caliber of um yeah slasher movies in the 80s like i know there's some good halloweens there's some good friday 13th and there's some good slashers in general but this one just does such a good job of still feeling fun while still scary well, and and it can still be yeah. really dark a lot of the time which i you know that's why like i yeah i was i've been really tired from work but i could not wait to talk about this movie and just yeah yeah like i am same man. I uh, I think great. it's fantastic. Great. It's yeah. It's probably one of the best, if not the I'm best. Looking, I am seen. looking forward to watching. I am looking forward to watching uh, and talking about part four. Yeah, and, part four uh, is still still fun. I remember that movie being a lot of fun. So hopefully it's as much fun. And I'm gonna keep saying fun. I, I think I've only seen I, I I've only seen part four maybe once. I've seen this now. This uh, part three was my third rewatch. Okay. So I'm sure you'll have some I fresh. Think... I I think after watching this one though, and this one being fresh in your mind, I'm not trying to. Right. I'm not trying to be like I'm talking you out of it because we're 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 in it now. But like part four, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm part I'm gonna be let a little bit let down too. It, it is a lot of fun, but this one I've seen twice. I've seen part four twice. Okay. And I gave it a two and a half. So we'll see if that. Uh... Wow. What would you give part four? Oh jeez, I don't even know. I'd at least give it a pass. I still think it's, yeah, I, it's good. I didn't, give it a, I didn't give it a pass, but I'll, I'll probably, like, we'll see with the rewatch, but... Because this one just has the characters, right? I think it's what we talked about before. I think, I, like, after this one, yeah, after this one being so perfect, I think 4 was just such a letdown for me. Yeah, but the characters, I mean, everything. We'll see, we'll see. I'm going to rewatch it this weekend. We're going to talk about it next week, and yeah. Yeah, this one is, like, it sets the stage. I love love Dream Warriors. Now that I watch it again, it's gonna be. This is kind of the one that I'm gonna <laughs> be like, is this one as good as Dream Warriors? Right? This is like a benchmark type because it's just one one last thing I want to say about the movie too is it just has that dark tone, like um the world of Nightmare on Elm Street. Like you know you don't get to see a lot of the outside yes. world, especially in this movie. It's mo mostly at the hospital, but the scenes like even in the bar, exactly. But like so nihilistic at a hospital. Having having your movie like a horror movie set in in a hospital with with kids like this is it's so dark and yeah yeah the scenes of you know the subtext and about the parents not being there especially with Kristen's mother right she says well something to the effect of her episodes got worse when I took away her credit card it's so much disconnect right. with the parents and the kids but the kids know better. And having these new characters exactly. introduced who you care about, bringing back old characters. It's, it's 
so good. What's the Chris, Eric, Kristen's, uh, Kristen's mom's boyfriend like? Hey, it's the whiskey. Uh, where's the bourbon? Whiskey. Or the... Yeah. Where's the bourbon? That's it. That's it. That's it. Where's the bourbon, bitch? Yes. And Freddy cuts her head off later. <laughs> but that that scene's so sad too because it's like Freddy knows her fears, right? Because in the opening of the movie, we have this play out in reality, or at least what we assume is reality. Because afterwards, she does fall asleep and go to Freddy's house, right? The the nightmare yeah. house. But before that. Her mother has a guy over, and he says the line, Hey, Elaine, where's the bourbon? And it's just sad, because her mother is clearly not caring about her own daughter in, like, distress. Yeah. She's chugging freaking, you know, Coke with caffeine, instant coffee, and listening to Doc and making yeah. Popsicle, Freddy House, Popsicle Stick Freddy Houses, and the mom's more worried about having a guy over at the house, right? It's just, it's sad. Exactly. And then when it plays out later in the movie, the same kind of thing happens. Right, uh, Freddy picks up on that, and he kind of exploits how the parents. Elaine, where's the bourbon? And then when he cuts her head off, where's the fucking bourbon, bitch? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> like that's just so such a cruel thing, right? Because her mother's actually being nice to her when she comes and interrupts her from making the Freddy house. She's being a bit too nice, which is why you know you're like, why is my mother actually like? Oh, I'm wondering. I'm actually worried about you. That's the horror that Freddy is using to haunt. Kristen in her dreams before he shows up and tries to kill her and I think that is just so cerebral and like I think that psychological terror of it too like the cat and mouse of Freddy in this movie is perfect whereas I think we'll, we'll, we'll discover as we go on I think and remember or have new thoughts who knows but I think that's like the tough part yep. to, to balance in the later ones where it's not just this character likes comic books, so I'm in a comic book fr fighting Freddy now. And this character is the <laughs> Karate Kid, and now he's fighting Invisible Freddy because we ran out of budget and time. You know what I mean? <laughs> the girl is afraid of comic yeah, no, I, I mean, I love the Roach Motel scene. Don't get me twisted. But yeah, what but I'm, no, you know, you know but what like I, mean. I see what you're saying. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. Like this movie is, uh, I, I don't know. It's just totally. I love next level the nihilism and the the, the dark humor. Those and the kids you actually care about, I think, is what elevates mm -hmm. it amongst some of the contemporaries. So, any, uh, I'm just rambling at this point, man. You got any final, final thoughts, Dream Warrior? No, I. Uh, <clears throat> and we've been talking for a while, and like I, I knew that we would be because I couldn't wait to talk about this, and I love this movie, and yeah, no, that's that's it for me. I'm I'm looking forward to part four. I'm looking forward to our discussion of four, five, and six. Like, yeah, yeah, I think they're going to be like, interesting. This this one was this one was the one that I was like pumped for because I love this movie so much. But like, yeah, four, five, and six, it should be interesting. Oh, and new nightmare. Yeah. And we're we're gonna do no, new, new nightmare. Yeah, new nightmares. Great. I can't wait to watch that one again. Take some notes and do Thank some you. research on it. And if uh, you yeah. folks out there and wherever you're listening to this land, um have any suggestions or thoughts on film club or the movie that in discussion today dream warriors you know share some stories when was the first time you saw it Do you have any spooky memories or uh, any thoughts on what we discussed here today i don't know i think it's probably the best nightmare on elm street movie in the original series i concur it's uh i feel one has a lot of nostalgia to me because that was the first one but part three yeah woo, it's good it's real good. So it's real good. It's real good. So any folks out there, smash the subscribe button, ring the bell, like if you if you will. And uh or just, you know, say something mean in the comments. I don't know. I love love to read it all. <laughs> Anything about Dream Warriors related or if any if you think uh we're way off base on on our takes here. <laughs> kind of the fun is uh seeing what some people have have to say and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about it, man. It's uh, fun to share yeah, these. Absolutely. these can't wait. Talk about these movies. Wait for next week and uh, part four. The Dream Master. Anyway, we're out of here. Dream Master. Uh, All right. Dream Warriors. Out. Peace.